Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Sech the Shabbos DAF Tzadiches begins with a brief statement about throwing an object from one Rishos to another Rishos over a Rishos in the middle. Then we'll get into a halacha describing what a Rishos Arabim has to be, what it needs to look like. The Gemara will have a bunch of questions on it from the description of carrying the boards on wagons in the times of the Mishkan. The Gemara will analyze how the boards were carried in length and try to resolve the question. This will take us into a whole other discussion as to how the boards were shaped and how the curtains which covered them were measured, and that will take us to the end of the daf. So let us begin. We start at the bottom of the previous daf, Tzadi Zayin. And the Gemara says that if you throw an object from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah, passing over Rosh Hashanah in between, so we have a b'risa that says that you're only violating Hechel Shabbos Do Raisa of carrying if it flies for Amos in Rosh Hashanah, even if you need to combine the two parts that it flew in each Rosh Hashanah, meaning it flew, for example, two Amos in the first Rosh Hashanah, then it crossed over Rosh Hashanah, and then it flew two Amos in the second Rosh Hashanah. Those would combine to four total Amos. Now, the Gemara says that we learn to Allah Hasmir. First of all, this b'risa obviously holds that you can combine two separate flights into one malacha of the four Amas. We had seen that Rabbi Yaisi holds you can't combine two separate rishuyos, two separate travelings and two separate rishuyos. Another thing we see is that it's not considered to be that the object has landed. We don't freeze frame the object when it's over the rishuyos and view it as if it landed and started again. If we did that, it wouldn't have to travel for Amas. It would be violating Kachel Shabbos just by the fact that it crossed into Rosh Hashanah and then out of it again. Okay, that's the end of that discussion. Now the Gemara says that Rosh Hashanah uh, Yehuda said in the name of Abba, in the name of Huna, in the name of Rav. A Rosh Hashanah cannot be roofed. If you have a roofed public area, it doesn't count as a Rosh Hashanah. How do you know that? Because the camp of the Jews in the Midbar, the desert, is where we derive the Lachas of Rosh Hashanah from, and that wasn't roofed. So therefore, Rosh Hashanah, which is roof, doesn't count as a Rosh Hashanah, at least not the Raisa. Now the Gemara is going to question this based on a statement concerning the carrying of the boards, the Krushim, the uh, panels of the Mishkan on the wagons. And the Gemara is going to try to describe how the panels were stacked on the wagon in order to be able to solve this. We're going to have a few different attempts to describe how they stacked the panels. So first of all, how did the panels travel? When the Mishkan was disassembled, the walls were broken up into panels, and these were stacked on two wagons, which were driven by the Bene Merari. The wagons were five amos long, and the boards were stacked widthwise. Now the boards themselves were one and a half amma wide each, and one amma thick. So how do you fit stacks of one and a half amma wide boards onto f- a five amma long wagons? So first of all, the Gemara says, what's the problem? The problem is that we have a statement of Rav, which says that the sides of the wagons and between the wheels of the wagons and the space between the wagons all counted as Rosh Hashanah not only that, even the space underneath the wagons counted as Rosh Hashanah. Now the problem is that if the boards are stacked on the wagons, the boards form a roof. And the boards nearly meet each other. The wagons weren't that far away from each other. So how could you say that the sides of the wagons, between the wheels of the wagons, the space between the wagons, and under the wagons, how could all that be Rosh Hashanah if it's roofed by the boards that are being carried on them? Right? The boards were ten almost long. So they stuck out significantly on each side of the wagons. They were very long. So it, they, they roofed the space on the sides of the wagons. How could Rav say that that is a Rosh Hashanah? And that must prove that the fact that something has a roof doesn't make it not able to be considered a Rosh Hashanah. So the Gemara's answer will attempt to be that the boards, although they were stacked on the wagons, had spaces between them. And those are the spaces which weren't roofed, and that's what Rav meant counts as a Rosh Hashanah. We're going to try to figure out how those spaces work so that it shouldn't be loved. So first, the Gemara says you had three stacks of boards. Each board was an arm and a half wide. So in five amas, you could fit three stacks. So the Gemara says, so there were spaces in between, and those spaces weren't roofed. The Gemara asked, but if you do the math, 
three stacks of boards I'm going to have wide is four and a half amas. The whole wagon was only five amas long. That means you only have half an amma of total space. In three stacks, you have two spaces between the three. And that means that each space was only a quarter of an amma wide. quarter of an amma is uh, one and a half tvachim. That's less than three tvachim. That's love it. And halachically, that's considered closed. So that would be considered roofed. So this wouldn't work. So Gemara says, okay, the boards, the panels weren't stacked um, on the one and a half amma side. They were stacked on their thickness size. Their thickness was face down. And that was only one amma. So therefore, in the th- in the five amos of the wagon, you could fit three stacks of the boards, an amma wide each stack, because it was the thickness side down. And therefore, you had two amos of space. So one amma space between each of the stacks, that's more than lovud, and therefore that's where there was no roof, and that is considered rishas around. The says, but hold on a second. Why do you think they only stacked three stacks then? If it was stacked on their sides... So they could fit four stacks, and they would have four stacks each of an amma th- of an amma wide in a five amma wagon. That means that they had one extra amma, but this one extra amma was divided by three spaces now because he had four stacks. That means it was two tvachim per space. Two tvachim is less than three, and therefore it's lovered again. So it's roofed again. So Gemara says now there is an opinion that the boards. We're going to see this later in. The daf. There is an opinion that the panels weren't straight up. They narrowed towards the top. At the bottom, they were one tefach thick. But t- towards the top, the thickness sloped. And at the top was only one finger thick. So according to that opinion, this could make sense. Since the boards are lying on their sides. So on the, on the end, which is narrow, there is much more space between the boards. And then that wouldn't be... Love it, and you'd be able to say that's what Rav was referring to when he said that it wasn't roofed, and therefore when he said that it's a Rishas Arabim and it wasn't roofed by the boards. But according to the other opinion, that the boards were rectangular and they were th- they were uniformly thick all the way up, so you don't have enough space here. You got four stacks with only two tvachim between them. So the Gemara says they weren't stacked. You're right, there were four stacks, but the stacks weren't spaced evenly into three spaces. They were spaced. There were two stacks at one end and two stacks at the other end with no space between them they were flush and that way the space in between was an amma wide and that's not lovud and that's where the ceiling was now the Gemara says uh, that's where there was no ceiling and that's where uh, it's called Rishas Sarab so now the Gemara asks well, hold on a second what about underneath the wagons Rav said even under the wagons but the bottom of the wagon roofs the space under the wagon and Rav still said that's a Rishas Sarab so the Gemara answers that it, it, that the wagon did not have a solid floor. The wagon's floor was made out of a couple of ribs, and therefore there was no there was no seal. This ends this particular discussion. The Gemara now moves on to discuss the machlokas as to whether the panels of the Mishkan were uniform all the way up, or they were sloped and they narrowed at the top. So the Gemara quotes a brisa, which explains the opinions and their sources, and how each one understands the other one's source. And then the Gemara will show how this makes a difference to the roof of the Mishkan, which was cloth that was draped over the top and hanging down the sides as to how much they hang, and the Gemara will show a few ways in which the opinions differ regarding that. So first of all, the Bryce. The Bryce says that the shape of the panels are Melchokas between Rav Yehuda and Rav Nechemia. According to Rav Nechemia, they slope towards the top and they narrow. Now, the Gemara understands, and we'll see this later, that if you were standing inside the Mishkan and you were looking at the assembled walls, you would see straight walls. The inside wall was straight up and down, it was vertical. It was the outside wall that sloped, narrowing inwards towards the top, to where it was only a finger wide. That's from Yehuda's opinion. Now, Rev Nechemia says, no, it was even, it was straight, it was uniform all the way up, it was an amma wide at the top and an amma wide at the bottom. Now, the Gemara explains the sources. The sources come from the same Pasuk, describing these panels, it says that these panels should be flush at the bottom um, and then they should be yachtav and tamim, what do these words mean? so yachtav, the Gemara understands to mean that they should be uniform tamim, from the word tam, which means to end means that they should slope to a sharp end so Rav Yehuda says, well it says tam, and therefore I know that they tapered to an end at the top. Rav Nechemia says, what well, it says, Yachdav, so they were uniform. So says, how does each one explain the other ones? 
So the Gemara says, Rabbi Nechemi says, the word Tom here doesn't mean that they ended, that they came to an end. The word Tom means that they were whole, they were solid. And it should be made of one piece of wood. It shouldn't be from a pressed together or nailed together smaller pieces of wood. Now, as far as the word yachdav, so Rehuda says, it doesn't mean uniform. The word yachdav means that they should be flush. There shouldn't be parts where one panel sticks out further than the other panel. It should all be even. Okay. Now the Gemara has a kasha on Rabbi Huda. How can you say that the outside sloped inwards? What happened at the corner? The board at the corner, then, would stick out past the slope. One wall is sloping inwards, and the wall that's perpendicular to that is flat. And that edge would stick out past the part which slopes inward. So Gemara says, um, that can't be, because we know that you're not allowed to have one board sticking out above the other, or outside the other. So the Gemara says that the corner panels were sloped not only inward thickness, they were also sloped from side to side, in order that it matched the perpendicular wall. So that board had two sloping surfaces, one just like everybody else did, and one where it sloped from its side towards the other side so that it matched the wall that it was adjoining to. Okay. The Gemara adds in another pasuk here describing the walls, which isn't really related, but it says that the the walls were held up by beams that ran along the length of the walls. They were horizontal beams, like braces, that ran along the wall, holding all the panels together. So those beams ran as follows. There were three sets, one at the top, one in the middle, one at the bottom. There were five altogether on each wall. The top one was made out of two, one that started on each end and they met in the middle. The bottom one was the same way. The middle one, though, was one solid bar that ran all the way across. So the Gemara has a pasuk that says that the bar was a bria chatichon was besorcha kashim. It was, first of all, it was not outside the walls held on by rings. It ran through holes through the middle of the walls, through the center of each panel. Not only that, but it actually curved. The three walls of the Mishkan had one beam running all the way through. And what they did was is that they stuck it through. They began threading it through on one end, and it miraculously turned at the corner and went all the way around um, to the, all three sides. Okay. Now the Gemara goes to discuss how the roof, which was made of cloth, draped over the Mishkan, and the Gemara will show that it was different for the two opinions here. First of all, let's describe what the Mishkan looked like. The Mishkan was a rectangle, which had walls on three sides. The rectangle, the inner dimensions of it, not counting the walls, were 10 amas by 30 amas. It was 30 amas long and 10 amas wide on the short side of the rectangle. The long sides were the north and the south sides. The short side was the west side. The east side was open and had a screen in front of it. Now, there were three layers of cloth draped over the top, and they hung down on the sides and on the back on the north, south, and west side. One of the layers also draped a little bit, hanging above the east side. So first of all, we'll discuss the bottom-most layer, and that's called Mishkan. That's the name of the layer. That was made out of <coughs> strips of cloth, which were 28 amos long and 4 amos wide. There were 10 of these strips sewn together so that the final sheet was 40 amos by 28 amos. And this was draped over the roof and the sides of the Mishkan, the walls of the Mishkan. And it worked out as follows. The 28 amos long length was draped over the width of the Mishkan. Now the inside of the Mishkan was 10 amos wide. That means that of the 28 amos, 10 amos went to cover the inside, and the rest hung down. Now, according to Rabbi Yehuda, at the top, there was no thickness of the walls. So you had a full 18 amos left to hang down, and you had 9 hanging down on either side. According to Rabbi Nechemia, there was a thickness there of an amma on each side, 
And therefore, you only had eight Amos hanging on each side. Now, how tall was the Mishkan? The panels of the walls were ten Amos tall, but the bottom Amos was encased in the Adonim, the sockets which held them together. So there were nine Amos of wood, and the bottom ama was made of the silver Adonim. So according to Rabbi Huda, the Mishkan cloth draped on the sides nine Amos, and it covered the entire board, except for the Adonim. According to Rabbi Nechemia, there was the, it hung down only eight Amos, and therefore there was one ama length of the board itself visible between the end of the cloth and the beginning of the Adonim at the bottom. Now, what about on the west side? So the length of the cloth together was 40 Amos, and the length of the Mishkan was 30 Amos. That leaves 10 Amos over. So according to Yehuda, you had all 10 Amos hanging down, and it, hang, and it hung all the way to the floor. According to Rebbe you had to have one Amos spread over the thickness of the wall, because he held that the wall was an Amos thick at the top also, and therefore you only had nine Amos hanging down, and it ended in Amma before the floor. Now the Gemara discusses the second layer. The Mishkan on top of this cloth had another layer. This, the upper layer, this is actually the middle layer, was called the Oyel. The Oyel was made of hairs of a goat woven together. And this was made out of 11 strips of cloth, which were each four amos wide. And each one was 30 amos long. They were all sewn together or hooked together for a total of 44 amos long by 30 amos wide. Now, again, we make the same calculation. As far as the width, there was 10 amos over the inside of the Mishkan. That leaves 20 amos. According to, that leaves 20 amos left of the 30 amos width. According to Rav Yehuda, all those 20 amos hung on the sides, and it hung all the way to the floor. According to Rav you had the thickness of the walls, and therefore you only had 9 amos hanging on the sides, and that reached all the way to the tops of the Adonim. Now, what about on the west side? So before we get to the west side, we have to discuss the east side. This covering hung two amos on the east side. There wasn't any wall there to drape over, but it hung over the opening two amos down. Now, there was a total of 44 amos, and the Mishkan was 30 amos long on the inside. So you got 30 amos for the inside, 2 amos for the hanging down part, that leaves 12 amos left. Contra of Yehuda, all 12 amos hung down, and the Mishkan was 10 amos tall, so 10 were covering the walls, and there was 2 lying on the floor. Contra of Nehemia, there was 1 amma draped over the top of the thickness of the wall on the west side, and therefore you only had 1 amma left for the floor. So the Gemara says this is a problem. This is a problem. Because the Psukim clearly say that there was a serach, there was an overhang at the end, which was half the thickness of a strip. Now a strip was four amos wide. According to Yehuda, that's very good. There was two amos on the floor. According to Nehemiah, there was only one amos on the floor. So how do you explain it wasn't half of a strip, it was only a quarter of a strip. So the Gemara says it doesn't mean that it was hanging on the floor. It means that it was overhanging the cover underneath it. The cover underneath it reached to within one amma of the floor. This went all the way down to the floor, plus an extra amma further. So it was two ammas longer than the cover under it, which is half the width of a strip of the cloth. The Gemara now has a price which describes what the Mishkan looked like. It says, Rabbi Shmuel says, a ton of debate, Rabbi Shmuel says, it looked like a fancy woman walking in the street with her train trailing behind her. Similarly, the Mishkan had its uh, cloth, which formed the roof and draped over the sides, trailing behind it. This takes us to the end of Daf Tzadi Ches, and we'll pick it up with Daf Tzadi Tess. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland Shul and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.